years now, but particularly, and Michael Pricer, thank you for all the work you put into things. We've got a lot of work to do on the talent initiatives collectively for the industry, and we're going to keep, keep the pedal down on that. Also want to thank um, our sponsors this morning. Uh, to Denso, GS3, Toyota, and Next here. Please let's give them a round of applause for hosting us this morning. And also to our investors, and almost a, a good portion of you are in the room today with us, but we can't do the work we do, uh, Caitlin and Jen and, and, and our team, without you and your investment in us. So thank you, we really appreciate it. Because our job is to work for you. That's what we do. We're committed to the auto and the industry and and how it's transforming and, and the talent that's needed to it. So thank you very much for that. So uh, just a little bit of a background as to where we're at. And we do this every year. Um, it's been quite a while since uh, Mish Auto was conceived and it was born. And um, it, it doesn't seem like that long time ago, but it was back in 2007. That's when it was originally started as a very grassroots effort where we put a group of people together literally in a garage uh, with some beers and said, we are not doing everything we need, need to do to protect the auto industry that we have in Michigan. It's our signature industry. And over the years, it's grown and it's got more momentum, more momentum and we've gotten more investors to where we've evolved to a point where we have 120 now. But through that progression, we've evolved too. And so one of the things that we've done, and some of you saw this yesterday, is we've always said we want to make sure that our mission stays core promote the industry, retain the industry, and grow the industry. But what we don't want to do is duplicate and replicate uh, what others are doing. We want to find where people are doing best things. In fact, where's Chris Marshall? Chris, are you? So Chris is with Winning Futures. And if you don't know Winning Futures, you should know Winning Futures. So what we've done is we've picked four or five organizations, and Winning Futures is one of them. And we want to make sure we're aligned with them and we're promoting the work that they do. Uh, but there are others. So again, we want to fill the space where it's needed. And one of the key things that we're going to keep doing is focusing on the, the image perception gap that the industry has. So we're going to continue to do that. But part of that is refining the strategy and making sure that we're really focused and we're doing things that are impactful and relevant and, and putting the investment that you make in us to work. So that is our plan. And some of you saw it yesterday. Also, if you didn't see it this week, we've announced uh, new data. Um, Unbelievably, uh, sometimes we kind of say, well, why don't we have that number? Where's that number? What does that number mean? And one of them was, what is the economic contribution of the auto industry to Michigan? So we partnered with public sector consultants, and we put this new study together, and this is a summary of it. But the economic contribution of the auto industry to Michigan is $225 billion. To put that in context, um, the agriculture industry in Michigan is a $100 billion industry. The second thing I'll point out, there are 712,000 jobs, uh, both direct and indirect, that are directly tied to our auto industry. 7.4 billion in tax payments, and 83% of that is directly tied to the manufacturing community. So we do have the auto dealers and service and repair in there. Um, we do not have retail in those numbers. So these are the economic contribution numbers, and this is the impact that the industry is making on our state on an ongoing basis. But for today, um, and where we're going to talk today about today's session, the other reason we did this is to frame things. And we all know, because the last couple of years we've sat in this room and we've talked about the mobility world and where transportation is evolving. So to put it in context for you, the global auto industry is kind of thought about as a tr $3 trillion industry. And you can look at different numbers from different firms. But if you look into the future, in the not too distant future, and we all know it's changing, with hyper-urbanization, scarcity of resources, demographic shifts, personal mobility and a shared use economy is a really big market, right? And we can see that's why all the bets are being played. That's why the new technology is being developed. So if you look at where Michigan is, where the global industry is, where the economic opportunity is, we look at our industry and we say, this industry has technology that can literally save lives and it can reduce congestion, and it can reduce emissions, and there are things we can do to solve global problems. And it's incumbent upon us to do that, but it's also an opportunity for us. And for us, and, and when I say us, we have today OEMs, suppliers, there are community colleges, universities, economic development agencies, all in the room here today. These are the stakeholders of our industry together. So it's incumbent upon us to protect the industry, but to seize the opportunity too. 
So what we're going to do today is not look too far into the future. What we've asked uh, a couple of our guest speakers to do is to put things in context to you today. Uh, the industry is changing, but it's changing like right today. Um, for example, the announcement of the, the potential merger that's going to occur. So Mike Robinette is going to join us today. And if you know Mike, and I've known Mike for just a couple of years, right, Mike? Um, there aren't many people in the world that understand and look at the industry like Mike does. And Mike's going to take you through it and make you hopefully think you, uh, make you think a little bit about where your business or your university or your economic development agency is today and potentially where it needs to go. And then we're going to have uh, a Brian from KPMG talk about, you know, what's going on with the supply chain? What should we be looking now? How can companies invest in the industry that they have today while at the same time investing in future technologies and what that means and the different, different forces that are coming to play? And then we've got a great panel that's going to talk. Um, and then to wrap it up, we have Steve Kiefer, who's going to join us and kind of talk a, about, a little bit about what I touched on at the beginning, about how te technology can make a difference in, in our lives every day. So with that, thank you for being here. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Mike Robinette, and we'll get going for the morning. Thank you. Please welcome Executive Director of IHS Market you, Automotive, Michael Robinette. Well, good morning, and uh, thank you to Glenn and the MEDC staff, uh, not MEDC, Mish Auto staff, I have too many acronyms these days, um, as well as KPMG for the opportunity to come and speak to you today. So, as Glenn mentioned, uh, my job is to more or less give you some context in terms of what's happening in the industry. So we've got a presentation we want to show you called The Five Forces, and we'll talk a little bit about the market at the end of it, but uh, hopefully we'll... Uh, will uh, bring some good analysis, but also some good questions. Look forward to the Q&A and the panel afterwards. So secular shifts, secular shifts, shifts that are not cyclical, secular shifts that, that drive change in the industry, change that is going to uh, drive action and strategy by uh, suppliers and OEMs and the rest of the market. And then in the midst of a plateauing market. So all of this is happening as the market starts to plateau uh, and actually, in some respects, already has plateaued and starts to work its way uh, down into a, a, a little bit of a, of a valley going on, and we'll talk about that. So we are at an inflection point. Just a little bit about uh, today's presentation. Just give you a, a very quick view of what we do at IHS Market, and then again, we'll talk about the five forces and then some production dynamics afterwards. So very quickly, um, I'm part of the advisory team. I've been uh, part of the advisory team for about eight years. Since 1996, uh, with a company, either CSM or IHS Market, uh, really running our global vehicle forecast, which is really, uh, we estimate somewhere between 70 to 80% of the suppliers and the OEMs in the world utilize our forecast. So we are the industry benchmark. Sometimes it comes with uh, downside, but we don't mind being the benchmark. What do we do? We are engaged very often these days, especially with the supply base. There's a lot of trepidation out there. Where do I go? How do I maintain value? Uh, where does my operation move? Can I use some of these processes that I have and invented and the innovation that comes with it? These are all of the, a lot of the drivers that are, are, are really occupying the minds of suppliers, especially these days, and certainly uh, OEMs as well. All right, so with that, let's get into the five forces. Um, first one, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll basically uh, steal a little bit of thunder from Donald Rumsfeld, and we'll talk about, first of all, some known knowns. What are those known knowns? Well, again, the, the, the font's a little small, but uh, we'll have, make sure you have a copy of this presentation afterwards. Segment change. You take a look at the parking lot over in Mackinac City, a lot of sport utilities, a lot of crossover utilities. That segment change and the OEM change that goes with it, that is already in the market and will continue. We know that's, that's going, to be, going to be the pace. We also know, and if you're in the supply base and an OEM, you already know this, OE, our, our engine and transmission design uh, is declining. Uh, de declining in terms of new engine and new transmissions. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So that is a known known that's happening and you have to react to it. And we've got a lot of new players coming into the market, whether it be the Teslas or new suppliers uh, in the battery space or in the electronic space. Again, there's a lot of new players in the value equation. Those are some known knowns. What are some known unknowns? Well, we know electrification is coming. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but we just don't know exactly how quickly. And frankly, we get that question a lot. 
how is it coming? How quickly is it coming? How is it going to impact me? And certainly we can, we can drive estimates in terms of where that's going to go, but a lot of it is driven by regulatory. And again, here I am at sort of a quasi-government conference talking about regulatory. It changes all the time. So that's certainly an issue. A lot of secular forces are going to change our industry, AV and EV as we call it. And certainly that's going to continue to move. Um, and then how every OEM, and we just saw this, we'll talk about FCA uh, and, uh, and Renault a little bit later, but every OEM is tackling this, this EV and AV problem a little differently. And, and, and you can see that there's going to be winners and there's going to be losers in this whole process. Then lastly, there's some unknown unknowns. So you certainly have uh, extraneous factors like uh, a flood uh, in Thailand or a tsunami in Japan. Uh, you just don't know when that's going to happen. You have to do your best to be able to re be ready for that. Um, there's going to be continue to be downsizing and consolidation. Uh, the FCA Renault discussion is very much part and parcel of, of what that is. And then there's going to be a lot of new partnerships that we never dreamt of before. And a lot of what Glenn talked about earlier is bringing companies together because 10, 15, 20 years ago, that used to be organic. But organic growth is becoming more difficult because you can't find talent. Innovation is moving more quickly. You have to do it through acquisition. So, so with that, let's talk about the, the five forces. Our friends in China. So I, I had a client uh, that is uh, a regional player, a stamper in, uh, in, in the Detroit area, and said, why do I care about China? Well, I'll tell you why I care about China. First of all, uh, back in 2007, they were half our market. 2009, just two years later, they were exactly the same market in terms of size of the United States. And by 2025, they'll be double our size. So just that in context gives a, a feel for, yes, it, this is a critical market. Well, let's go beyond that. Go beyond that, there was a day where we used to send our old and tired vehicles to China. Oh, go build this, I'm done with it. You'll love it. We loved it, but we'll move on to the next one. Well, that doesn't happen anymore. In fact, China is the mother plant to a lot of new platforms and a lot of new technologies. So, so those days of sending our, old, sending our old and tired vehicles is finished. And the, the Western OEMs, 90% of their production, they not only make in China, but they also make in Europe or in North America or in some other part of the world. So China is globally integrated, very important. And then lastly, take a look at what, and again, this is according to our forecast, but both Volkswagen and GM, close to 40% of their production will be in China. So if you're in strategy at either of those companies, you're saying to yourself, hmm, 40% of my volumes in China, guess what's gonna drive my strategy? It's not gonna be Indonesia, it's not gonna be India, it's not gonna be Mexico, it's gonna be what happens in China obviously that's a growth market. So obviously that's pretty important in terms of how China influences the market. A couple of other factors. Again, the, the market is going to continue to change in China. You're going to find certainly the, uh, in fact, by 2022, uh, basically the government has said, you as a Western OEM, we don't really need you anymore. You can stay and if you want to employ our people, that's wonderful. Well, we got it from here. And so that's actually pretty interesting if you think about it. And there's going to be at least five Chinese OEMs that are going to be more than a million units in the very near future. And so that also signals to you that this is not going to be just a China factor, that they're going to grow outside of China as well. So that's uh, what's going on with China. Propulsion. And again, this is a significant issue in the industry. If you're uh, a supplier in the powertrain space, uh, you ask this question of yourself all day. What's going to happen with, with my components, my systems? How are they going to change? And what's interesting is you start to see that both Europe and China, uh, their regulatory regimes, I wouldn't say are mirrored, but they're moving in roughly the same direction or very close to the same direction. Whereas uh, certainly Europe is a little bit more focused on PHEVs, uh, plug-in hybrids, and China maybe not so much. But nonetheless, there's a lot of movement in terms of moving towards electrification. And even by 2030, our feel for this is that the ICE and start, start, stop, so a vehicle without any real electrification will certainly be the minority in both Europe and in China. But you flip that over to North America, and our regulatory regime is a little different here. Uh, obviously, we drive larger vehicles and a lot of other factors. The problem could be is that 
if we sway too far away from what China and Europe is doing from a regulatory perspective, we run the risk of not being able to export our vehicles to other parts of the world as well as our technology to other parts of the world. So this is a, this is a significant issue in the market. I started showing this slide about five years ago, and I had a client say, you, you have no idea what you're talking about, this is not right. Well, trust me, you talk to just about any powertrain supplier, any OEM, and they'll tell you, we're not designing any new engines right now. There's a couple of large ones, Ford's got a couple, GM's got a couple variations, but they're all over five liters, and they're all more for, for certain duties. But the, most of the volume is already out the door now. And so these OEMs, virtually every OEM, is going to be working on the top half of the engine. Induction, injection, ignition, thermal efficiency. Those are the things that are going to drive more and more activity on the powertrain side as they move resources over to electrification and new types of transmissions and ability to move propulsion to the road. So again, this is a significant issue not only for the industry, but certainly if you think about it, for Michigan. How do we transform a Michigan to make sure that we take advantage of this transformation? Number three is autonomy. So it, you, you start to get a feel for the, uh, for, the, for the flow here. China, then we'll talk about EV, and then now autonomy. And autonomy, what's interesting is you hear a lot, and you'll hear a little bit later about autonomy and some level four and level five. But to be honest with you, the rubber really meets the road with level two and, and moving into a level three. Um, and who can do level two better than the next guy? Uh, think of it as level 2.1 and 2.2 and 2.3. That's really what we're looking at for at least the next 10 years. Uh, moving into level four and level five, yes, that's moving. And there's a lot of edge cases that need to be worked out, a lot of new technologies that will be tried out in level two and level three and finding their way into level four and level five. But to be honest with you, when you really think about it, the real battle from a volume perspective is going to be in, in, in level two and then moving into level three, at least for the next decade. And so you can see that in this particular forecast as you move into level one and level two and level three. Globally, uh, North America is a leader, but certainly the Chinese are moving very quickly in this respect as well, so let's not count them out. So it is important, um, and one thing I think is critical, it's really starting to blur that whole relationship between the OEM and the customer. I saw a really uh, fantastic supplier presentation uh, at the, uh, uh, the Consumer Electronics Show this, this past January. It was interesting in a sense that this one supplier CEO said, listen, we used to go and take all our innovations right to, directly to the OEM. Here, here's what we've come up with. Does this, this, does this stick on the wall? Does this work? And now they're basically saying, you know what? I'm going to the customer first. I'm going to go talk to the customers first and then take that to the OEM. That way, I'm sure that the customer wants it and it can use that as a, as a driver. So again, that's going to find its way into autonomy and mobility, making sure that the customer is going to be accepting of a lot of this new technology. So, number four is old co versus new co. And this is going to be a little bit controversial. I know some OEMs are in the room, but, but let's tackle it anyways. And you start to see that this movement away from the more fixed cost related uh, current industry where we're producing vehicles, we're producing powertrains, producing components, uh, and building those vehicles versus what we call new co, such as uh, Ford Argo AI or uh, GM Cruise, or and certainly Volkswagen is splitting its business as well. And as you split these businesses, you have new needs for talent. You have uh, maybe a more openness to be able to partner with customers, or excuse me, with companies to bring in new technologies and innovations and move the market more quickly. You're probably less reliant on fixed assets, and it's probably more soft content versus hard content. And again, you might say, well, those are just subtle differences, but again, think about how the current automotive industry is structured, and in, and in these new companies, yes, they're still gonna to need to build some level of mobility, they're probably gonna do it in a much different way. So the um, reason why we bring this up is as a supplier, you need to figure out a uh, longer term where you fit. Do you fit in old co, or do you fit in new co, or do you, do you bridge those two? And this is gonna be an important discussion uh, over the next decade or so. 
And then let's talk about the ecosystem. So we've got here basically three types of platforms. And uh, again, mostly suppliers and OEMs in the audience, so you've seen these pictures before. The uh, conventional platform, which is most of the vehicles that are sitting in the parking lot in Mar Mackinac right now, uh, where someone said, hey, let's turn this into a mild hybrid. Oh, we don't have room for the battery. Let's put it behind the, uh, the seat or we'll put it in the tunnel or we'll find a place for it. The vehicle was never designed for a battery bigger than your average 12 volt battery. So again, that and the propulsion system were sort of uh, jammed into the vehicle and not really optimized. But virtually every platform under development now is what we call a multi-energy platform. It's designed with packaging that battery and electrified propulsion system and the charging system. Uh, all of that is being packaged into those vehicles right now. So I contend and a lot of other people contend that the most complex vehicles we're going to build are the ones that we build over the next 10 years. And while you might say, well, that's easy, of course, there's more complexity, but think about it. We now are, are essentially jamming in two propulsion systems into most of the vehicles that we'll be building. And so that, again, drives a lot of complexity, a good, a good market for suppliers, but also a lot of challenges from uh, packaging, from a heat perspective, uh, from a perspective of, of noise and, and NVH, all those issues really come up when you have two propulsion systems on board and trying to keep your customers happy. And then we've, we've heard in the press for the last couple of years about what's going on with skateboards, and we've, we've had some announcements lately with Rivian and other companies like Lucid and F SF Motors and Neo in China. Um, and again, what's going to happen? And this, this really changes the way that we have to think about the industry. We almost go back to the 50s where everything was body on frame. Now you'll have body on skateboard. And, and again, is this going to happen tomorrow? It's already starting to happen. But the, the real volume is really not anticipated probably for, for some time. But getting ahead of it is what a lot, of, a lot of folks in the industry are doing. But think about that journey. Think about where as a supplier or as an OEM or even in economic development, your, uh, your constituents are sitting with respect to that pendulum and a lot of the changes in terms of the value chain. So let's talk about that value chain. These are some quick estimates that we did uh, in terms of the value of, of an ICE vehicle, a full hybrid, and a BEV. And, and that's, this is in today's dollars. So this is not necessarily assuming that we do assume that the battery cost is going to go down and maybe some motor cost will go down. But when you really think about it in today's dollars, it's a much different value equation. It's a situation where the propulsion system is uh, a, a large portion of the ice, but not overwhelming. But you look at it, it from a BEV perspective, and that's basically 60% um, of the value of, of the BEV is coming from the uh, motor charging system as well as the battery system. So What's the message here? Well, the message here is if you're in some of the other parts of the vehicle, you've got to continue to fight really hard to differentiate, differentiate yourself, drive value, and really uh, continue to get the attention of OEMs because they've got all these other challenges that they are facing in terms of bringing uh, these, this other content into the vehicle. So those are some five forces. Let's just get into some quick production dynamics. Um, this is a, a slide that we use on a fairly frequent basis, but the message here is that the industry is slowing down. And you're probably thinking, well, thank you for the, uh, for the news notice, but the industry is slowing down, even on a global basis. It's slowed down, certainly in China. In fact, going slightly backwards of late in China. It's slowed down significantly in Europe. It's slowed down here. Uh, other markets that were pulling uh, their socks up, like India and Brazil, are, are having a little bit of an issue. But... If you do look longer term, and again, that's our job, let's look longer term, we still anticipate uh, strong volume from China and also certain markets in Southeast Asia, such as India. That's going to be probably 70% of the, the volume growth in the industry. Why do we say that? Well, again, it depends on what type of supplier you are. If, you're, if you basically make money on making more of, of what you build, then certainly looking at, continue to look at China and India from a growth perspective is important. But if you're a content player, then continuing to look at the developed markets, probably including China, would be important as well. Okay, uh, this, is the, this will be a little controversial, but hopefully not too much. But this is, if you think about the industry 
Um, there's kind of the way that the data tells you to look at it, and then there's the way that we feel that we should look at it. And this is the second one. So if you think about Toyota with their friends and Mazda and Suzuki and Subaru, they're a pretty formidable company. They're by far and away much, much larger. This is not the way the data is tallied, but this is in, in more and more going forward, this is the way these companies are gonna think. They think scale. They think, can I, can I borrow technologies? Can I borrow an innovation? Can I spread these costs over more and more vehicles? This is the way they're going to think. Uh, Volkswagen, when they start talking to companies like a Tata or even a Ford Motor, they're thinking in the same chain. They're thinking about scale, especially with all these new requirements for EV investment, AV investment, and all the, all the, the seismic changes that are happening in the industry. It's critical that they take a look at, can I spread these costs and spread the risk over more and more vehicles? And you can see, as you kind of work all, you, all, you, all the way down, uh, various OEMs in terms of their position. What's gonna happen though is some of those smaller companies, and we saw that, and I'll show you a slide on FCA and, and, uh, uh, and, and Renault in a minute, but those smaller companies are gonna be under more and more pressure every day as they have to afford to bring out a small skateboard or a large skateboard, or they have to afford to bring in an autonomous system that they, they don't wanna buy from a supplier, maybe they wanna invent it themselves. All of these factors are critical and those smaller suppliers, or excuse me, those smaller OEMs, they're all going to be looking for partnerships, every last one of them, because they all work in the same, in the same industry that the rest of us do. So this, uh, this was a slide I actually built last night. Uh, so please excuse the uh, arrows and boxes. It was, by the way, I didn't get my luggage until nine o'clock last night either, so it was a bit of a long day. But, but let's just take a look at what's happened. So FCA and Renault, and, it, and you might say a little bit of an unlikely couple, but they, they have chatted in the past and there's been some collaboration back and forth between these two companies in the past. Not a lot, but some. But when you really think about it, we think about indexing. Indexing is, is where is a particular region in terms of its size in the industry and versus where, it, where are you in versus that size? So are, am I underrepresented or over, over, overrepresented or under or over indexed? And when you look at it in Europe, they're still going to be, if you add together what's happening with, uh, with FCA, Renault, Nissan, and Mitsubishi, they're still gonna be over indexed in Europe. So that's issue number one. Uh, they're gonna be continue to be under indexed in China. So this, this uh, partnership, 50-50 partnership, I have trouble saying that because I've historically been through a couple of those and it doesn't work out so well. But nonetheless, 50-50 partnership underrepresented in China. That, that to me is still a glaring issue. Renault and FCA are not major players in China. So again, this is still an issue. Uh, they're going to be uh, a, a bit, uh, you know, they're actually even interestingly under indexed, even when you add in Nissan in Japan and Korea. So that actually is a good thing. And then they'll be overexposed or at least more exposed to North America. So this is a North America European play. A lot of it, my, my opinion, there's going to be some rationalization that will probably have to happen, even though that the companies have said, yeah, we've got this. We think we'll be able to occupy all the plants and more is better. I'm not so sure, and I think longer term, we know that some rationalization, especially in Europe, is probably going to have to occur. Again, how that occurs is going to be another story. I think the other issue is, is how quickly or how uh, active Nissan is going to be as part of this consortium. Is Nissan going to allow for some of their platforms to be used by a Renault and by an FCA? This will actually be quite interesting to see how all this unfolds. So this has not been written in ink yet, uh, but nonetheless, it, it's an interesting partnership. A lot of it has some moving dynamics, especially with Nissan, um, and, and uh, I guess more to be uh, reported on later. Let's take a quick look at the North American market. And, and we've already seen a lot of this happen, but the Detroit 3, and again, apologies for the Detroit 3. They don't like to be called that, but, but it, it, again, from a traditional perspective, this is the way we, we talk about the industry. Um, have, have really taken some volume declines over the last couple of years. Why? Well, as you move out of sedans, especially in the Midwest, that's definitely going to impact your, your total volume. And there's been some new facilities that have been 
uh, built by other manufacturers, whether it be a Toyota or a Volvo or uh, BMW and Mercedes uh, in uh, the Southeast. So again, there's been some new volume coming on. And when you look at it, that's going to change the pendulum in North America, more towards the other OEMs versus the Detroit 3. This is a story we've been reporting for several, several years. It continues to be a story. New vehicle launches. So if you're a supplier, your bread and butter is, I'm on a program, I'm launching a nameplate at a plant, I've got to deploy people, I've got to make sure tooling is ready, I've got to make sure my processes and all my capacity is ready, all of my supply base is ready. So think about all the chain reaction of making sure that I've got that instrument panel ready in the middle of 2021 for when they start to build that vehicle and all the work that goes along with that. Really interesting, if you look at this year, we're going to have a high number of launches this year. To be honest with you, that meant that we did a lot of the legwork back in 16 and 17 to get ready for a 2020 launch. So if you look at 2022 and 2023, we've got some decline in the number of launches in total. That means that the work that we're doing now and maybe into next year, maybe not quite as active as we were in the past, at least getting ready from, a, from an innovation perspective and tooling and some of those other aspects. One thing I do note is if you take a look at 2022, right now anyways, and again, the, the forecast changes uh, occasionally, but we're only looking at probably eight launches with the Detroit 3. And most of the other launches are, are occurring with, with other OEMs, especially the Japanese uh, and, and Hyundai. So again, critical to understand where your market is going, the pace of the industry, uh, important to understand uh, from an innovation and a staffing perspective where you go. Then there's some regional shifts. And again, if you can't tell by my accent, I'm not from this country. Uh, but so I always try to talk about the Great Lakes and include, let's include Ontario. Let's not, let's not miss them. Um, and if you think about it, that's where most of the volume decline has occurred in the industry, is in the Great Lakes. We were at 8.2 million vehicles just a couple of years ago, and out to next year, we're only looking at about 6.6. .6. Now, that's 1.6 million fewer vehicles. Now, interestingly, Michigan has been able to hold up its end of the bargain through that process. We've lost some plants, but we're still roughly a third of the Great Lakes and still be you know, a major player in the Great Lakes. And we anticipate that to continue to be the case through 2025. The Southeast will continue to hold its own and the complexion is different. There's fewer Detroit 3, more Asian and more German manufacturers down there. And then Mexico, interestingly enough, which is once thought of as a 5 million unit market, at least by some, not necessarily us, uh, there's been a plant or two that have come off, but there's still a solid 4 million unit market. And this is, again, how the industry is kind of settling out uh, over the next couple of years. And, and you're not going to see a lot of new capacity, uh, you know, maybe not so much in terms of brand new capacity, but some shifting capacity uh, with FCA, downtown Detroit, which is great news. But there's going to be some movement, but not a tremendous amount. A lot of the new capacity has been built. So let's just go backwards a little bit and talk about what's happening in North America from a propulsion perspective. And again, so just a straight internal combustion engine, that continues to decline, that's fully expected. An internal combustion engine with stop-start, which again is a slight variation on the internal combustion engine, uh, is going to continue to rise probably until 2022, 2023 when it'll start to uh, peak out. And in fact, in Europe, I think it's next year, it already is peaking out because we're already moving to alternative forms of electrification. And you see that, at least in North America, with electric, full, and with mild, we're going to focus probably a little bit more on mild in our market uh, and use it to get that vehicle off launch to, to really help with fuel economy at that pace. It's the lower cost solution to go to a mild hybrid versus a full electric or a full hybrid. Um, and again, that's probably the way that our market's going to grow for at least the next five or six years. After that, certainly there's going to be continued movement towards full, maybe some PHEV, uh, as well as mild hybrids. But nonetheless, this is the way that we see the market moving. This, in contrast to what's happening in Europe and China, where they're going to focus more on, again, those larger variations of electric vehicles. So just to bring it together, um, the markets are plateauing. And so we had this great run for eight or nine years. I had a lot of suppliers. 
that did some really good things over eight or nine years. I've also had some clients that got a little bit fat and happy and, and didn't mind building the components on a Saturday. Trust me, if you're building components on a Saturday, you probably really need to look at your operation and whether you really need to do that. Uh, because again, the industry is starting to plateau and that's additional cost that the OEM is not going to compensate for. Um, there's more risk out there. So we've seen investments on the EV side and the AV side, new types of drivetrain and propulsion structures, a lot of risk. And everybody's doing it just a little bit different. In fact, if you take a look at battery structures, uh, there's no real SAE standard in terms of how to do a full or, or a BEV battery. Everybody, it's kind of like the Wild West. So until the industry kind of gets their hands around it and say, let's build some boundaries in terms of how we build these batteries and how we engineer them, so maybe we can drive some additional scale. Until we get to that point, it's gonna be very problematic. And we really feel that Michigan, uh, for all the great things that Mish Auto and MEDC and other organizations have done in Michigan, has to continue to adapt, has to continue to, to take a look at what's going on in the rest of the world and say, how do we continue to be the relevant location in the world from a development and an innovation perspective to make sure we have a strong role in where the industry is going, whether it be autonomy or in electrification. So with that, thank you so much for your time and I look forward to the panel discussion after. Please welcome Principal of Strategy and Operations Management at KPMG LLP, Brian Higgins. Now I can step on stage. I can't beat that introduction. Um, but um, so we're shifting gears, literally and figuratively here. So the prior conversation, the stuff that Michael ran through was, it's a fantastic call to action, right? There, there was, there's tons of headwinds. There's a lot of these market dynamics that are shifting. There's everybody in this room should feel a little bit uncomfortable, you know, to a certain extent. Not depressed, because the objective isn't to, to depress anybody, but there's certainly a lot of things as an industry that we're up against. In this particular conversation that we're embarking on for the next 40 minutes, you'll hear from me for about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, to tee up this topic and this, this digital supply chain. So how do we shift from all these market dynamics into a conversation on digital supply chain? The reason we're doing it is we're, we're thinking about levers that you can pull or push to influence some of these headwinds, to influence some of these market dynamics and challenges. And we're laser focused then in an area on operations and supply chain. And that, that particular domain within our collective organization is, is equally as challenged as some of the market dynamics. And we start off with a, <clears throat> before we get into a conversation on, well, what are these technologies and how are they applicable and how are they gonna help with some of these head, uh, headwinds potentially, I wanna root ourselves in a conversation on value. You know, because all too often when we talk about digital technologies or, you know, anything from a blockchain to AI to cognitive to whatever it is, it's divorced from a conversation on where is the value expected to come from. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. I'm not getting emotional. I think it's literally a problem. The, <laughs> it's very emotional. The, so, you know, th this, this equation that we have up there, you know, there's very many ways to talk about value and how we create value and where we need to focus. And I'm not going to go through a primer on it. The, the, the problem statement on the screen is pretty simple. It's how do we maximize revenue for our organizations while simultaneously attacking the operating expense and the investment? That's the equation. And to the extent that we introduce new ideas, concepts, and technologies that support that mission, great. Value is created. To the extent that we fail to do that, obviously it's a little bit more of a question. And when we talk about digital supply chain and the technologies enabled, they, they are, they're, they're, we're littered with examples of where this divorce occurs, meaning you know, we can't articulate the value. So I wanna start with that as a backdrop and then we'll, we'll finish uh, rounding it out. So digital disruption, you know, what, what is it? You know, we hear a lot about digital disruption, we hear a lot about this continual thirst for more and more as a consumer. It leaks into the professional world as well. And when we think about digital disruption, it's really this whole notion of saying, hey, there's new technology out there. There's new technology out there that's giving rise to new operating models, new business models, new ways in which we do things. And these new technologies are, are disrupting us. 
you know, they're disrupting us because they're upsetting the traditional value equation, the value proposition. So the way in which we typically deliver value, products and services, is getting disrupted as a result of a lot of the technology. And when we talk about the technology itself, you know, in this supply chain and operations world, there's often a dozen or so technologies that get a lot of a lot of press and a lot of attention. And they're 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 mentioned on this tile board up there, whether it's cloud or cyber or Internet of Things or blockchain. You know, these are the technologies that often rise to the surface when people think of digital technology, potential implications, you know, these these are the wow factors. And these they've been around three, four, five, some of them uh, years, some, some longer. And the challenge that we see out there is that companies really struggle with understanding these. The clarity of mission, the ROI, the, the, the potential integration points. So these technologies have a little bit of a cloud over themselves and it, it, it's a very dizzying task for people to sort of sort through potential application in their organizations. So at KPMG, we were on our second year of a digital supply chain survey. We launched it last year. We refreshed it just two months ago. And the real purpose and intent was to, to scan the market and get an appreciation from organizations on how they're thinking about these digital technologies. And we queried on a couple of different areas. This particular one, the first sort of set of questions was, well, what are the drivers of investment? What is really causing you to take a look at some of these technologies? And, and, and suggesting that you should part with finite dollars and resources. And from the man, for the manufacturing sector, because we looked at multiple industries, but for the manufacturing sector, the single largest driver of investment was this notion of real-time product visibility. Right? It's this whole, the holy grail, I call it. Right? This has been around for 20 years, uh, supply chains and organizations associating a huge value with, hey, if I can understand what's happening to my suppliers, my suppliers, suppliers, all the way through to point of use or point of consumption, there's tremendous value that can be unlocked there, whether it be inventory, quality, cycle time, total cost, whatever it is. So that's been out there a while as the holy grail. But if you peel this back, one of the interesting things that, uh, interesting things that we heard in this survey was that there's less than 20% of companies out there that feel as if they've got that list. So it's a big driver of investment and these digital technologies, and companies are looking at these digital technologies as a way to say, hey, maybe you can help me with this product visibility issue that's been out there for so long. The remaining two, innovate faster, speed and agility, and lower cost to serve, these have been in the domain of supply chain and the charter of supply chain and operations for years. So not a huge surprise that they're there, but they are significant drivers that are suggesting that people are uh, looking to adopt these digital technologies. On the flip side, right, we asked the question then that said, okay, well, tell me about inhibitors to investment. You know, on the previous slide, we talked about what's causing you to make investments. Here, it's what's preventing you from making investments. And, you know, the, the results came back, and the single largest one was resistance to change. And, you know, you could say, okay, maybe this is a cop-out. Maybe this is an excuse for people embedded in the organization that just can't get things done. I think the reality is probably a little different. And I think when we talk about the technologies, the blockchain, the AI, the cognitive, the robotics, those are pretty complex by their very nature. And long gone is this notion of, hey, as a supply chain and an operations executive, I can carry that torch forward. I now have to deal with multiple stakeholders because these technologies touch multiple stakeholders. So it's a lot more difficult to get things done. I need engineering, I need commercial, I need finance, I need IT, I just can't do it by myself. So the reality is there's a lot of interrelatedness in these reasons or these inhibitors of investment in the supply chain tech. Uh, the complicated decision making is very interrelated to the same resistance to change issue and management commitment. So another view of this, you know, we asked on a year-over-year uh, -year basis, relative to some of these big digital technologies. You know, what are you doing as an organization? What are your plan adoption on the x-axis versus the impact that you're targeting for your organization? And we took the, the largest seven, and we got this in uh, last year in 2018. They, they were plotted out. 
and you can see them, you know, the blockchain and the AI, etc. And the takeaway here was very interesting. In the upper right-hand quadrant, just last year, there was a, a lot of planned adoption and a lot of potential impact expectations on IoT and cognitive analytics. Makes sense. The other things were scattered through this, through this plot on an experimentation basis. This year, just two months ago, we asked the same question. You know, what's your planned adoption and targeted impact for some of these technologies? And the movement was, was terribly interesting. And what I'll draw your attention to is there's two things on this page that were going up and to the right, right? Meaning more planned adoption and a belief in the, in the impact got higher. And those two things were the cognitive analytics and the artificial intelligence, right? And that's, okay, what does that tell me? What does that tell me? I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting observation in isolation. But the reality is, if you, if you again peel that back a little bit on the planned deploy, deployments, the, the reason that AI and cognitive analytics are jumping to the forefront relative to some of those other technologies is that it meets the criteria of being, hey, I can measure the value associated with this thing. The use cases are generally fairly clear, and it's not intergalactic. You know, I don't have to get every nook and cranny of my organization nodding their head and saying, yep, oh, got it, got it, got it, check. It's not a launch the space shuttle initiative. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that cognitive AI and machine learning are going to be the highest yield and the highest return, but it is an interesting dynamic in the marketplace that we're seeing a lot more of these in-flight and planned deployments than the other thing. And then the last takeaway from the, the survey that we ran, we were you know, also interested in you know, what, what does good look like, right? Let, forget the individual technology stack and diving into the pros and cons, you know, but if we have an understanding of the drivers of investment, if we have an understanding of the inhibitors of investment, one of the things that we wanted to know is, you know, are you structured for success as an organization? And the feedback was no. You know, we don't really have good line of sight on the ROI. It's sort of lost in different pockets. And more importantly, the governance that we have within my organization doesn't lend itself for the nurturing and experimentation of these digital technologies. Right? That came across loud and clear and represented in this stat that just says, hey, only a quarter of these respondents said that these digital projects are aligned under a signal govern single governance process. And, you know, it was this notion of, hey, I'll dole out some investment dollars, but there is some divorce from the overall value and the overall ambition of the organization. And there's not a central view that's looking at this holistically to say, hey, does this make sense for my organization? So the last thing that we wanted to leave you with before we do hop on the panel and have some discussion on, you know, these particular areas was, uh, you know, real world examples. You know, and obviously it's, uh, these, this is sort of where it brings, brings to life. You know, what are we talking about of cognitive analytics? What are we talking about machine learning? You know, all this stuff sounds fantastic. But so I pulled up one that we did uh, within KPMG, right? And we have this concept called intelligent analytics and we've done it for a, a bunch of use cases and a bunch of organizations in the manufacturing sector. And it's all about what we call a signals repository. And the hypothesis on this big data solution, think of it as just a better mousetrap. There's things, there's data out there that we have access to do and we make decisions on that data today. This is just a bigger, fatter mousetrap, right? There's a, there's a bigger data ingestion tool, there's more machine learning, there's a bigger platform where we're saying there's a lot of signals out there that should influence my business. And to the extent that I have visibility and understanding of those signals, I'm gonna make better decisions. Pretty, pretty simple premise. And when we talk about this signals repository, it is this, this stage gate view of collect the data, develop a signal, ensure that you've got a indication or an insight to make a decision off of. And again, the, 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 the newness here is just the actual technology and this active listening platform that goes out to all these different data sources to make sure that you've got the latest and greatest information by which you make decisions. And when we talk about where this gets applied, it gets applied in a ton of areas, right? Many of which are represented up here. When we do anything from a retail, uh, retail site selection, customer growth analysis, underwriting, 
Um, and in the supply chain and the ops area, the one I wanted to highlight is in this shifted demand, right? Our collective supply chains and organizations are generally steered by the perspective that we have on demand. You know, if we have a good view of demand, that steers millions and millions of dollars throughout the supply chain. If we have a bad view, it steers it in a different direction. So this demand, shifted demand example of this signals repository is, it's outside industry, which is great. I think we can learn outside of, outside of automotive, outside of industrial manufacturing. And it basically takes this signals repository platform and for a big retail chain that has a lot of complexity, associated with it here in the US, we said, well, let's isolate the signals and the data that we think are a good representation of foot traffic, right? People that go into this store. And we isolated some, and then we built this signals repository and platform to go actively listen for it, right? And these were things that intuitively make sense, but until you've got the data and the machine learning and the platform built, they're really hard to get after. Things like school calendars, road closures, you know, local events, weather patterns, socio-demographic information and changes, you know, um, ATM locations. I mean, things like this, they actually influence the demand. So we built this signals platform, we had it actively listen, and then that's what fed sort of the forecast models to get a much better appreciation for, okay, I understand what's really driving foot traffic, foot traffic at a very, very granular level. And we apply the same in the industrial manufacturing world. It's just different, you point it in a different lens. We do this for should cost modeling. We do this for make versus buy. We do this for complexity and portfolio analysis, you know, at the SKU level. So it's just meant as, you know, when we talk about AI and cognitive and big data, there are some real, real live use cases that sort of fall into this, you know, better mousetrap view. So with that, um, I think that serves as sort of a foundational bed associated with, you know, what is digital supply chain? What are some of these technologies? And I think it's now jumping into the panel. Joining Brian Higgins on stage, please welcome Group Vice President of Vehicle Quality and Safety Engineering for Toyota North America, Jeff McKerwitz, Chief Operating Officer and Co-Founder of May Mobility, Allison Malik. Purchasing Director of North America Business Unit for Ford Motor Company, Robert Tranzu. And to moderate the discussion, please welcome host of AutoLine, John McElroy. Well, good morning, everybody. We should have a great panel discussion here with what Brian just teed up. We've got two massive traditional automakers and a brand new startup, too. So we're going to get a bit of a variety of uh, viewpoints on all this. But Jeff, let's start with you. Toyota, you, you've heard uh, all these digital tools and technologies being talked about. What's Toyota doing with it and how is it impacting the company? Well, first of all, let me thank Mish Auto for giving me the opportunity to, to be back and participate in today's discussion. But John, I think last year you mentioned a quote from our global CEO, Akio Toyota, uh, that mentioned the auto industry going through a once-in-a-century transition. And uh, we have a lot of disruptions coming our way, right? Um, new technologies, we have new competitors and new services. Uh, throw on that evolving customer expectations and now new trade rules and tariffs and all of this. So uh, as Akio went on to state, it's no longer a matter of winners and losers. It's, it's life and death. And so we as a company need to transform the way we work. We need to become a mobility company. Um, we need to look for better ways to, to move people around, whether it's across town or across the room. So we've really been looking at how do we uh, change and transition as a company. And uh, right now we're going down two paths. Um, one is uh, certainly investing in our core, uh, which is today's product and strengthening that uh, for today. And then also investing for tomorrow and looking at some of the new technologies as covered by ACES or we refer to it as, as CASE, certainly. Um, but, uh, you know, we've been investing in uh, new, new companies. Uh, we've created uh, Toyota Research Institute, uh, Toyota Connected to look at big data management. Uh, we've created Toyota AI Ventures uh, that are looking at new startup companies and new business models. And so doing a lot of investment for the future. And all these companies are at arm's length from the core Toyota uh, because of the bureaucracy. We want them to be able to move quickly and make decisions in a timely manner. 
uh, but also on the core side, strengthening our, our processes. So we've been redefining the way that we design, develop, and build vehicles. And actually, one of the things that we've learned is that a lot of these technologies we're investing in for tomorrow are applicable today. And so we're starting to see, uh, we're de deploying the Internet of Things uh, on our assembly line so that uh, all of our processes are, are communicating 24-7 so we can understand what's happening and take preventative measures if something is going out of control uh, to minimize the impact. Uh, we're applying machine learning, some of our vision recognition systems, uh, which are so critical to, to ensuring our, our, our vehicles are, are accurate as ordered. Um, we've had issues with them if the lighting's a little bit off or if there's a little vibration in the line, these systems go haywire. And so using machine learning, these systems are able to learn and correct on their own and so we don't have to deploy resources to, to fix that. Uh, we're also using 3D printing um, and additive manufacturing. Um, some of our lines that used to take 14 hours to repair a die and now it's down to 30 minutes or less uh, using uh, some of these new technologies. So again, it's really been um, uh, informative, and I think the key point is we're trying to embrace some of these new technologies, not be afraid of them. Rob, same question. Going on at Ford, what have been some of the key successes? What have been some of the big challenges to adopting these digital tools and purchasing? Yes, uh, so thanks, John. And first, thank you to Michado for inviting me to participate. Um, I enjoyed the time yesterday and here today. Um, one of the challenges that we've been working through is just around governance. So we have, a, or Jeff mentioned, a number of the technologies Ford similar is pursuing those. And what we've found has been an important enabler is to establish a single governance. Um, you've heard a lot about it, Ford. We like to establish rooms. Well, similar here, we have a room that's really, really focused on these new technologies. We're um, committed to uh, leveraging our digital technologies to drive improvement in our business. And really, what Brian talked about in efficiency and quality and also relationships. So we're... Um, what I'd like to share with the team is, or the group, you know, with that and, and how we want to advance that, we're very closely, you know, very shortly going to update our Q1 standard to uh, provide a digital readiness uh, assessment. And I think many of you understand Q1 is important, it really is a, is a future uh, consideration uh, for short -term. So explain a little bit more. How are you going to measure? What should suppliers be aware of in this assessment in their digital red readiness? So we'll have that. We haven't rolled it out yet, John, but uh, that, stay tuned. And <laughs> we'll have the opportunity for that dialogue. The sneak peek. <laughs> Allison, let's hear uh, about what your thoughts are. I mean, you don't have to go out and necessarily improve a supply chain. You've had to go out and just build one from the get-go. Uh, yeah. Have any of these digital tools played a role in what you've tried to do at, at Main Mobility or have done? So first off, thank you to the Machado team. I'm excited to be here and to be able to, to represent a little bit of a different perspective. I did come out of auto, so I under, understand it. Um, but for our company, we are a, a smaller company based in Ann Arbor, a, a Toyota AI Ventures backed startup working on really transforming cities with self-driving technology. So we are grabbing the, the autonomous technology that was talked about and, and focusing today on how we can rethink transportation with our self-driving shuttles. We're out on the road today and our focus is how we can help people get where they need to go safely, easily, and with a lot more fun. And so it's been interesting to be able to run with one of those technologies and really think about how do we rethink the business a lot of the discussions around supply chain and probably why it's a little bit easier to adopt um, some technologies versus others is when they fit into your core business, it becomes pretty straightforward. But when you have to rethink who is your customer and how do you serve them, it can turn everything on its head. And so for us, it's been an interesting balance as we think about our customer is ultimately riders. It's not people that are going to buy the car. It's actually people that we, we interact with every day. So there's challenges and opportunities with that. And then thinking through our supply chain, we manage fleets of vehicles. So supply chain isn't necessarily just getting the vehicle through the line and off the line and thinking about quality from a, a, an overall recall perspective, but actually managing that fleet and what, what types of insights can we use to be able to predictively understand when we need to um, either uh, recalibrate sensors or, or swap out components We've been able to extend the value that you might see in traditional automotive quality all the way through how we manage the fleets. Well, good. 
Brian, real interesting presentation that you gave there. I especially was intrigued by this idea of a signals repository. Now, you seem to be looking at very broad macro inputs and, and the like, uh, kind of forecasting where demand's going to be. Can you take that same concept, though, and, and bring it into the supply chain? Because I think that illuminating what's going on from that standpoint would be extremely valuable for both OEMs and suppliers. Yeah, absolutely. And we have in certain instances. So that whole concept of a signals repository builds out over time, right? It's this active listening platform. So you build it once and then it pays dividends for, you know, as long as you're going to use that signal or input. And we have done some things that are, uh, you know, more manufacturing improvement related and leveraging, you know, demand and supply data for a, a manufacturing plant or facility, IoT data, you know, th things of that nature are also data and signals that obviously drive, drive some decisions. In your presentation, you showed some of the, the signals that you're collecting, sports attendance, housing starts. Right. Very interesting. What, what kind of things would you be looking for in the supply chain? Well, and, you know, again, it's, it's things that are going to influence the supply and demand patterns. So if you, if you dissect that, if you think about on the demand side of the equation, depending on your business, if you're a, an OE or a tier one or a tier deeper, obviously there's, there's uh, different drivers in your demand. Um, generally, people have a pretty good understanding of those drivers, at least for the most part, but it's the timely, accurate refresh of that information and the processing it that's, that's a big challenge that these new technologies and data ingestion tools can take a lot of unstructured stuff as well. So the, these are the sort of incremental improvements, not the do all end all, but certainly there's a lot on the, on the demand side and on the supply side, it's the, uh, you know, it ties a little bit into that notion of that end-to-end -end visibility objective that was sort of pretty predominant in some of the, some of the survey feedback. And there it's just a reach out, you know, across your enterprise to your supply base or a contract manufacturer or whatever it might be for, um, for visibility into demand, demand start, supply, capacity. You know, because one of the biggest ills that we see in the supply chain arena, and, and auto is particularly guilty of this, is a general assumption of infinite supply, right? Which is very dangerous and a very costly assumption. So something like this signals repository done appropriately will sort of needle at that and, and say, okay, is that really a fair assumption in your particular organization? That's it. Jeff, uh, you, you saw uh, uh, in Brian's presentation too, he was uh, uh, illuminating what some of the inhibitors are. Uh, What's been the case at Toyota? And, and, and we don't have to just look at the inhibitors, but what have been some of the things that have really driven the adoption of these tools? Well, I, I think as, as we look at big data, for example, there's just with, with the um, adoption of uh, DCM, data communication modules, which will be on a, nearly 100% of our vehicles by 2020, there's just significant amounts of data that's being generated. So every few microseconds, there's hundreds of data points coming from all the sensors on the vehicle to tell you what's going on. Now, of course, the customer has to opt in. We're not just stealing or taking their data. If they opt in, uh, then we have, uh, we have uh, you know, rights and access to the data. But there's a big difference between data, to information, to knowledge, to wisdom, and how that data gets utilized. And uh, we're collecting so much information, and all of the functional areas are knocking at the door to get that. Now, we have a centralized repository. Toyota Connected is getting all this data. Uh, but how to get the data organized, how to get it to the functional areas and appropriate means and methods in a way that it can be utilized. So, for example, our powertrain would love to know how a customer is driving the vehicle and so that we can tune properly. Our quality groups would love to know if there's a defect, right? Really detection, really resolution. Um, we have uh, vehicle performance groups that would love to have information to know how to develop parts. Um, you know, what type of criteria do we utilize? So all this data can be utilized for, for engineering R&D uh, in an effective manner. Um, again, the issue is how to get from data to, to wisdom, and that's what we're going through. I'll also bring up, too, I'm not sure how many of you heard about the California Consumer Protection Act, um, which is going to be a, a, a huge um, obligation for all companies. Um, just a, a few seconds to explain that, but basically any company that does over $25 million worth of business in the state of California has certain obligations. And uh, it's twofold. Number one, uh, there's uh, consumer protection. So uh, a customer uh, has the right to contact you to ask what data you have on them, uh, to stop collecting data on them, or to delete all the data. Um, a company has obligations to protect the data. 
Now that sounds reasonable, but when you start getting into the penalties, potential penalties, uh, if you don't respond to the customer in 45 days, it could be up to a $750 fine that you have to pay to the customer. Um, if the data is breached or leaked, it could be $750 that you pay to every customer whose data is breached. There's a million customers, that's $750 million you're paying out. Uh, then it goes over to the state attorney general and they can investigate. If you're liable, it could be a $7,500 fine per case. So now you have, again, a million customers, it's up to $7.5 billion penalty you're paying. So this is only California, there's other states that are also considering this type of uh, mechanism. So data management is going to become essential and that's another area we're trying to get our arms around. Yeah, Europe as well is uh, uh, maybe not pushing it quite like California is, but much more pervasive all across Europe. Sure, sure. Um, Rob, let's go to you. Uh, we've been talking about all the, these great tools. Can you give us an example at Ford of how you're unlocking value in the supply chain by adopting some of the tools that has been talked about? Sure, uh, John, I'd uh, like to enjoy uh, providing your perspective there. Uh, at Ford, the technology that we've been able to use uh, most extensively is the cognitive analytics. And uh, the example, uh, the use case I'll point to is our supply risk management approach. We think of, uh, and just in the way of context, we have close to 1,800 discrete supplier manufacturing sites in the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. So we need to have a method to uh, assess risk. We think of risk in two categories, um, un unexpected or random. And in those events, when the risk presents itself, the team's focus exclusively on time to recover. But in the other area we view as predictive, uh, we're working on developing tools that we can raise aware or anticipate and raise awareness. And in this regard, we've worked with our global analytics team to develop two tools. This first is a supplier risk intelligence algorithm based. We use uh, operational and financial inputs and it will uh, provide a, an early indication of emerging risk and it allows us to intervene before there's an operational disruption. The second tool is a supplier launch readiness. Uh, similarly, an, uh, algorithm based, we're pulling inputs from advanced product quality planning and internal engineering inputs which essentially will, it's an early warning of risk associated with uh, production volume ramp up uh, if it's part of a new program launch. So using those tools as well as other methods, we've been able to significantly establish a trend of KPI metric improvement. And fundamentally, that's a, a reduction in production So you're, you're definitely seeing advantages to doing this. Yes, it's been very effective for us. Allison, let's go back to data a minute. I gotta believe data collection is a big part of your business. How, how are you dealing with this, this growing concern about privacy on the part of the citizenry? So the types of data that we collect right now are not focused on individuals. So as we think about the concerns that communities have around their own privacy, it is very important. And we have a bit of benefit in that from LIDAR traces, uh, so specific sensors that we use, we can't really pick out who a person is. Uh, so that uh, identifier capability, um, we don't keep any of that type of information. And so when we think about data, and a lot of the data conversations that we have actually ends up being with our community partners. So we are uh, working with the city of Columbus, Ohio, as well as the state of Rhode Island launch. We have services that any public individual can ride in a self-driving vehicle. Uh, in those cities, and as we talk with communities, that's where our, our data conversations get pretty interesting, because as we think about the change that, the, that this industry is undergoing, there are other people that are also going through that change. The cities uh, that have the road networks that we want to put our vehicles on are also trying to figure out what does this future look like? How do we manage the electric vehicles and make sure we have charging, and now there's scooters, and there's Uber and Lyft, they're adding to congestion, how do we deal with it? So a lot of the questions that we get about data are really around how does autonomy work, uh, which we work you know, high level insights on, who's using, who and how many people are using it and why? So really getting back to the user, the why. Why are we all here? We build vehicles to help people get around. And so it's been really refreshing to get to have those kinds of conversations about what data is really important to the, the point made about wisdom, that's, that's where data is actually useful. So how can we start learning now and generate that wisdom to help communities be able to adopt all of the new technologies that we're working on in a way that has fewer unintended consequences? 
you know, I've always thought that the way to get everybody to opt in is give them a piece of the action. Why should all these companies make money off my data? Why can't I get a little bit of it? And I think if the individual person was able to see that they are making money off their own data, they'll check the box every single time. Anyway, it's, off my soapbox for the moment. <laughs> um, Brian, one of the things that you talked about was uh, companies implementing digital tools without clearly thinking through the ROI or how they're going to enhance a particular part of their business. But it seems to me in the digital world, if you sit down and try to put together a business play, uh, plan, the train's already left the station. The technology is moving so fast, your competitors are definitely jumping in. How do you balance that? Uh, thinking, I got a gut feel that this is going to be good, but if we're going to go through the corporate process and everything like that, man, it's going to be next year before we even get going. It, it is a challenge, right? And that was sort of the, the, the last slide that um, I left on was this sort of inst this feeling that the governance is insufficient to be able to facilitate this kind of innovation process for these technologies, which is ironic because some of the very same companies that we queried are really good at innovation, right? <laughs> have it, have it, but it's sort of sequestered and then this gets lost a little bit. In the uh, in the overall shuffle, so you know, I think I think this whole notion of you know adoption of some of these AI and cognitive out front relative or at the expense of some of the others is again wrapped up in this. I get it; it's clear. I understand it. Um, but that that's a little bit of a uh, dangerous path as well because some of those other technologies and tools are going to be you know greatly more impactful, but. Until organizations get comfortable with a with a governance process that can say, "Hey, all right, I've got in, in the supply chain and operations world, there's really two things that you're after. Right? One is how do I how do I reduce some of the friction in the processes and the approaches that I have today, and then how do I improve the decision making? So it's the combination of those two things that these tools have to be purpose built for, reducing some process friction or improving the decision making. And that's it. But um, but it still is a it's a little bit of a wild west. We've heard that analogy even in the prior conversation and under a different context. But um, you know, we I see a ton of companies out there that are doing some science fair experimentation on a lot of this. But again, absent the right governance, it's not dollars well spent. Um, but the companies that get it right have a little bit more, and I got to be careful of this, but a little bit more of a center led approach to to the science fair and experimentation. Yeah, because one of the things we see out of Silicon Valley in terms of their approach is ready, fire, aim. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. just get going and then figure out how to do it. Right, which, yeah, can be, can be disastrous as well. But yeah. It can, but sometimes yeah. it's the way that yep, you've got to move yep, fast. absolutely. Okay, we're, we're down to the last couple of minutes here. Let's talk jobs. Hi, and Jeff, we'll start with you and move in. Quick answers, please. How does all this affect jobs, and what does the state of Michigan particularly have to be on the lookout for? Well, when we consider jobs from the manufacturing perspective, I know there was a big discussion yesterday about are some of these jobs going to be displaced as a result of this technology. Uh, in Toyota, we're not seeing that. Uh, we're using the technology for low-value added jobs, so where we can focus the workers on more creative and, and more uh, impactful uh, types of activities. Um, However, we are seeing an evolving workforce. Um, as a result, we need someone that can manage and troubleshoot some of this technology. Uh, so we need to provide better training to our manufacturing workforce and, and kind of change their role. Uh, so that's the biggest impact we're seeing right now. Rob, your thoughts on that? Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, or anything else that what Jeff said that's uh, similar to our point of view that uh, we can refocus and train those employees differently, but uh, more aggregate change in the manufacturing workforce. And Allison, your viewpoint, because uh, are you able to get the right talent you need for your startup in this area? So I missed that discussion yesterday, and I, I will uh, <laughs> dispel any questions. It's hard for everyone. We are all in this together, I'm assuming, since we're here at this event. And it's hard. Even being a startup with a great and exciting story, it's still a challenge. It's a challenge to get people to want to come here uh, to live during the winter. But I think... It's another challenge that every one of us has to bring the whole workforce along for this vision around new mobility and understanding how to, to operate better within supply chains and why. Why do I need the new skills to be able to use these new tools? We'll just keep doing the things that we're doing. And I, I think that all of us have to come together to spread the vision of things are changing and that's good, 
but also that we want to invest together to help people understand the, uh, the exciting opportunity that exists throughout this industry, from people that are working on manufacturing and making sure that we have quite high quality, up to we do lots of training for our individuals out in the field that are working as technicians and helping to reach our network force. It's, it's an exciting time, but one where we really all need to come together. Brian, you got the, the final thoughts on this. The, you know, the talent issue is is pervasive, right, across areas in this particular domain that we were talking about in supply chain operations. Even absent any of this technology and ability to navigate it and comfort with data and analytics, it's, uh, it's a challenge, right? So this sort of compounds the issue because the work packages, the work itself is is changing and it has changed over time. And it is giving rise to new skill sets and new capabilities. And you know, there's a lot of organizations that, again, are they're just dealing with this compounding effect. It's hard enough to get people in my organization that know planning, manufacturing, logistics, you know, whatever it happens to be. But then you got to layer on somebody that can have the vantage point that's required to sort of enable and deploy this kind of technology. It's really it's a tough nut to crack. Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Please, a warm round of applause. For Brian, Jeff, Allison, and Rob. Thank you all. Today, unbuckled seatbelts and impaired drivers still account for the most fatalities. Yet over the past 20 years, important steps have been taken. Seatbelt laws have helped drop fatality rates. Designated drivers and ride-sharing have begun to replace intoxicated motorists. Today, there's a new kind of impairment on the road. It's distracted driving, often through the use of cell phones and texting. In fact, up to 60% of teens admit to routinely texting while driving. What's the result? Distractions have played a role in nearly 10% of all fatalities in the past six years. On average, nine people die each day because of distracted driving. That's nearly 3,200 lives lost each year. In fact, it's the number one killer of teens and young adults under the age of 24. And the danger goes much further than to just the driver. It includes their passengers, other vehicles around them. It spreads to pedestrians, bicyclists, even those just doing their jobs, like law enforcement and road workers. The facts don't lie. If you text and drive, your next message may be your last. Here's the bottom line. Safe driving is everyone's concern. As an industry, there's a lot we can do. We all must work to strengthen vehicle integrity, invest in technology that avoids collisions and saves lives, develop autonomous vehicles, and above all, work together, industry and government to change driver behavior. We need education, legislation, and enforcement to send this strong message. On the road, we need eyes up, phones down. Together, we must work to ensure the safety of every driver, every passenger, every family, and every loved one, every day. Because ultimately, we have no greater responsibility and no greater challenge. Please welcome Senior Vice President of Global Purchasing and Supply Chain at General Motors Company, Steve Kiefer. Well, good morning, everyone. And thanks for being here. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be with you. First, let me thank uh, Glenn Stevens and Mitch Otto for this opportunity to speak up here. It's my first time at the um, Mackinac Policy Conference, and I have the um, honor to speak twice. I'm speaking to you now, and I have uh, another um, session as a Mackinac moment uh, this afternoon. Um, we can debate whether this is our greatest challenge or not, but um, as a father who lost his son about two years, eight months ago, it is extremely important to me I do believe it's our greatest challenge. I think we can all agree that keeping our customers and our families safe in the vehicle has to be our highest priority. <clears throat> this afternoon, I'm going to speak on behalf of my son, Mitchell, but today I'm speaking on behalf of 
General Motors. And um, at General Motors, um, a little over two years ago, we, uh, our CEO, Mary Barra, described a vision, a vision of zero crashes, zero emissions, and zero congestion. And I want to talk a little bit about all three of them, but mainly I'm going to talk about the first one. But let me start with zero congestion. First of all, let me start with zero congestion. Um, first of all, I, um, I think uh, giving our customers back their time is extremely important. I have a quick stat here. A 2017 research study reveals that U.S. drivers sit idly in traffic for an average of one full week each year during their commutes. So that's 168 hours of precious time at a cost of nearly $305 billion. Yesterday, the governor was looking for $2.5 billion. So $305 billion wasted. That's uh, about $1,500 per driver per year. So there's a lot of money here. Uh, for our part at General Motors, we're uh, offering uh, ride-sharing services like Maven, cooperating with, um, with uh, uh, ride companies like Uber, like Lyft, uh, recently announcing a, a new electric bike in Europe called Arib, which uh, helps address the last mile. And of course, for over 20 years, we've been uh, using a product called OnStar, which helps with uh, traffic information and traffic safety to help reduce congestion. Relative to zero emissions, We've said it publicly a number of times, General Motors does believe in an all-electric future, and we are committed to uh, eliminating all emissions from IC engines. It's a long ways off, but we've got a lot of work that's happening in the meantime. In the next, um, in the next 18 months, we'll introduce two new vehicles, two new electric vehicles. And by 2023, we have over 20 new electric vehicles that will be introduced to help address this. Uh, of course, we're um, committed to uh, this electric future, and um, the development is, um, is uh, obviously challenging. I think Mike showed some really interesting charts relative to the cost of um, IC engines versus hybrids versus uh, battery electric vehicles. We all need to work together at bringing the cost of these technologies down to get to this all electric future. But today I'd really like to focus my remarks on zero crashes. So of course, we see a future where our loved ones can all travel safely in autonomous vehicles. And for me, I just can't wait till that future happens. Most of you may know that each year, 1.25 million people are killed in traffic accidents around the world. Think about that number, 1.25 million people around the world. In this country alone, 40,000 people are killed each year due to uh, traffic accidents. And of course, um, we believe eventually autonomous vehicles can address this. Uh, I think most of you know 94% of crashes are caused by human error. The autonomous vehicle will eventually eliminate those errors. For our part, General Motors has a rich history in innovating. We've been given several awards. I won't read through all of these, but uh, I would mention that um, our GM fleet has more vehicles with five-star overall crash ratings than any other manufacturer in the U.S. But I know all of the industry is committed to safety and the safety of our passengers and customers. I want to hit on just a couple of technologies that uh, I'm proud that General Motors has uh, developed. I'm sorry, there's some of those stats. I'm proud of uh, some of the technologies that uh, General Motors has developed first in the industry. First airbags, actually General Motors developed uh, the crash dummies that all of us use to uh, develop our crash systems. The first automatic transmission, um, independent rear suspension. You know, I often talk about a technology that's kind of underrated from a safety standpoint back in 1912. General Motors invented the first electric starter motor, which eliminated the crank on the vehicle, which, uh, of course, was uh, the, um, the cause of many accidents and injuries as people were cranking vehicles. And then the side benefit of that was it opened up the automobile to a whole other piece of the population, women drivers. Women started driving after 1912 when they were able to get in a car with an electric starter, which was a Cadillac, by the way, and uh, able to, uh, to, to drive without having to crank the vehicle. Um, some of the more recent technologies that I'm extremely excited about, and I'll show a few of them here, uh, our rear seat reminder, safety alert system, and the team driver system, Super Cruise. I had a chance to drive a, uh, a ride, a CT6 uh, Super Cruise vehicle up here. I would say 80% of my highway time was completely hands-free. And it is really a uh, relaxing drive. And for those of you that haven't driven it, I encourage you to get out and try one. It really gives you a glimpse of the future, what it's going to feel like for us to be in these autonomous vehicles. <clears throat> um, but there's other technologies. Uh, I wanted to shout this one out. Um, this is a, an app that was the, the result of a hackathon with a bunch of young college kids around the world. They developed a, uh, an app that we introduced last uh, fall with General Motors called Call Me Out. It's an Android app that basically 
uses technology. If you touch the phone in the car, a uh, alert is given to you, but the alert is a message from one of your loved ones. Dad, please put down the phone. It's not worth it. Mom, put down the phone. So it's really personal, and again, the, the uh, your loved ones can call you out when you touch your phone. Again, available on uh, Android uh, phones. Just last week, um, General Motors introduced the Chevrolet Buckle to Drive feature, and this is a reminder for uh, team drivers. It's part of our team driver technology. So with this, the car can start but cannot be put into gear until the person buckles the seatbelt. Again, part of the team driving technology. Team driving technology also includes uh, speed limitation, uh, radio uh, volume limitations, and uh, can give the parents a uh, regular report on how their team is driving. I encourage all of you to uh, use that. I'm looking to see if my team is here. He's, uh, he's up here with me. But um, truly, there's a lot of technology that uh, can help you uh, monitor and keep your uh, children safe. Of course, uh, we've talked a lot over these last two days about uh, autonomous, and it really is our industry's uh, moonshot. Um, we look forward to the day when these, uh, all of our vehicles are self-driven. Uh, and as I said, 94% of the crashes that occur are due to human error, and we do believe that autonomous vehicles will eliminate all of them. Uh, the technology developed by many of our suppliers who are in the room, um, this is a, a vision of our first uh, Bolt um, autonomous vehicle which, uh, by the way, is built in uh, right here in uh, Lake Orion, Michigan. So another great Michigan product as well if you're celebrating uh, Michigan. Some of the technologies, the LiDAR, the long and short-term radar, um, artificial intelligence, and really the most advanced computing platform in the industry. These are all technologies that need to come together quickly to allow, to allow us to enable uh, level five autonomous vehicles, uh, the true uh, industry moonshot. I thought I would uh, put in this quick video clip. This is actually a ride in one of our cruise automation vehicles. This is a Bolt AV traveling the streets of San Francisco in an autonomous mode. Some of you may have seen these types of uh, videos before. I've had the opportunity to ride in this car several times. And you know, there's probably no more difficult place, at least in the United States, than the streets of San Francisco. And uh, the car, as you'll see, makes a lot of very important decisions. And this really works. So I won't uh, bore you with the whole video, but um, I assure you that the technology is ready. <clears throat> so, but it's ready at very small scale. And uh, the real question is, what can we do now until all of us are using autonomous vehicles, which is still many, many years off? So we really need to talk now about education and it's education around this topic of uh, distracted driving. <clears throat> this is some data from uh, an organization called Zen Drive. Zen Drive actually uh, is a tool that monitors driver behavior. They have about 60 million uh, users around the country, so there's quite a bit of data analytics around this. And the data doesn't speak well for our beloved Detroit. Detroit is number three. So this is, um, this is basically the percentage of time that drivers are spending on their phones while driving. While driving, look at the numbers, 9%, 8.85% in Detroit. This is uh, right off the data from these Zen Drive users. This is really horrific. And this is not a knock on Detroit. This is not a knock on Detroit by any means. I'm very proud of the work that uh, Chief Craig has uh, done, the work that he's been doing um, even with our organization, the Cooper Foundation, to try to improve safety and to try to increase awareness. But we have a long, long way to go. <clears throat> How many, teen, how many of you have teen drivers in the room, by show of hands? Do you love them? Or do you at least like them? This is really, again, horrific data for, uh, for our teens. So um, teen fa the, the fatal crash rate for teens, you're um, three times greater than drivers over the age of 20. Imagine that. Driver distraction is responsible for nearly 60% of the crashes that teens get involved in. And of course, I think most of you know, traffic crashes are the leading cause of death for our young people. So luckily, all of you are inventing some uh, amazing technologies uh, for the suppliers that we have in the room and for the automakers that we have in the room. <clears throat> um, let me fix this next one. There we 
you go. Um, all of our newer vehicles for uh, most of the automakers, certainly the ones that are represented in the room, we have technology. We have Apple CarPlay. We have Android Auto. How many people have that in their vehicles? How many people use it in their vehicles? All right. And more people using it than actually have it, it looks like. The, uh, how many people have Apple iPhones? And how many use uh, 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 Do Not Disturb mode on their Apple iPhone? Such an easy technology to turn on. Very easy technologies to use. Um, this allows people to drive in cars hands-free. There is no reason to need to touch a telephone when you're in a car. Bluetooth technology, hands-free technology, talk to text, Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, and blocking calls using tools like Do Not Disturb mode or Safe Drive mode on your Android phone. These are readily available and easy to use. So <clears throat> we're really focused on, um, on three areas, education, technology, and public policy. I think that um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, a couple of these right now. Um, innovation, I mentioned a few, and I know every time I give these types of presentations, I'm inundated with ideas, technical ideas on how we can fix this problem. And we need to keep them coming because we do still need more uh, uh, technical ideas. But I want to talk um, a little bit more about uh, policy. So uh, on March 27th, uh, which was my son Mitchell's uh, 21st birthday, we kicked off uh, something called Hands-Free Michigan. Did anybody hear of Hands-Free Michigan? Please, somebody. All right, now you're all hearing about it. So Hands-Free Michigan is uh, our goal to basically get hands-free legislation enacted in Michigan. We have uh, 18 states in the country that have this uh, in place. This means basically you cannot touch the phone in the car. Hands-Free Michigan. Uh, you touch the phone, it's a uh, primary offense, it's enforceable, you're pulled over, you're ticketed for this. The 18 states that have enacted these laws have shown much lower crash rates and fatality rates. It's very clear that this is the right thing to do. So one of our primary reasons uh, to be here on the island is to push this idea of hands-free Michigan. Some of you may have seen the um, Governor's State of the State address. She was kind enough to invite us to attend and basically she made, she made a call out about trying to make Michigan the 19th state with this hands-free technology. We'll talk more about that this afternoon. How many of you have heard of this term, the 100 deadliest days? All right, for those of you that haven't, we're in them. We're in them. Starting with Memorial Day through Labor Day, these are the days referred to as the 100 deadliest days. During these days, crash rates and fatalities in this country go up about 14%. Why? It's prom, it's graduation, it's Memorial Day, it's the 4th of July, it's the summer holiday with our kids enjoying uh, time off and it's Labor Day. Crashes go up 14% and I hate to say someone in your social circle is going to be impacted this summer, these hundred days. We all need to do something about this and do something quickly. <clears throat> so I'll finish by asking uh, if you'll get involved. I talked a little bit about hands-free Michigan. Um, I should also say that uh, on your tables, you may have wondered what this band was. So there's a little wristband on all of your tables. I would be honored if you would wear one. It's got my son's name on it, Mitchell Kiefer. Um, we, uh, and if you wear it for maybe today, and then when you get back to your cars, put it on your gear selector as a reminder. Give it to your teenagers, or take an extra and give it to your teenagers. Really enforce this point that the kids have to put the phones down in the cars. This is the best thing we can do in the short term to keep our children safe. I hope I can count on all of your support, and uh, it's really a pleasure having a chance to uh, speak with all of you. Thank you. Please welcome back to the stage, Glenn Stevens. Thanks, Steve. Really appreciate you being here. Okay, uh, I'm going to wrap this up real quick. And they're giving me this back there. So. Uh, if you can exit real quickly, because we have another session, uh, I would appreciate that. But thank you to KPMG. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to the team and to the speakers and the panel uh, very much. Uh, thank you for all your help today. So last comment, uh, just to borrow from what Allison said, we are all in this together. Whether it's distracted driving or where Michigan's going in the future, we've got the stakeholders in the room. We look forward to working with you more into the future. And thanks for being here today.